Hello and welcome back to this season of the GN in 1970. We're about to start season two. Again, I'm your host, William Sampson. I'm going to be able to walk you through what we've been working on on the Wilmer Sub, show you some of the stuff that my dad's been working on, as well as dive into some of the projects that uh, kind of got half finished out of season one. I'm hoping that we can fire the airbrush up, we'll get some brass cabooses painted, we'll get the uh, tail car for the Gopher Badger painted up, as well as take a look at the signaling system. That's been one of the biggest things I've been working on as of late. We go into the programming a little bit, as well as kind of what is entailed with the signals themselves. Um, there's a lot of stuff that goes into it. So we're going to dive into this season. Hopefully you can hang on to the grab irons and uh, enjoy this ride. All aboard! In this episode, we take a look at speed matching an E7 locomotive to compare to an Atherin ready to run. We take a quick overview of the m &S, as well as blow apart a couple more muscle cars. All in this episode of... Hey, we need to go back to 1970! 1970? Why? Because that's when things were great, just like the Great Northern. Doc, 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 hold on a second. We're going back to 1970? That's right, Marty. It's the only hope of model railroading. And we cover all this on this episode of the GN in 1970. 70s. All right, the first thing we're going to dive into is the JMRI Decoder Pro. It is key to be able to identify what decoder is in your locomotive, and how do you do that? Well, make sure your locomotive is on the program track, and JMRI is set to program track. You will then uh, open this up, you'll hit New Loco, and you can hit Read Decoder Type, and it'll give you a selection as to what decoders may be in that locomotive. I, I, I went to visit my parents recently. My dad always tries to get me to fix his computer when I'm home. He's like, you're so good at computers, you should be a computer programmer. I'm like, you're so bad at computers, you should be a caveman. <laughs> If you don't know uh, offhand, it's going to give you a suggestion. In this case, I do know it's a wow sound decoder. I have a Sioux line number 1400 sitting on the track at the moment. I'll open up the comprehensive programmer and I'll add the additional information, but I won't bore you with that right now. Here we're looking at a pretty short Great Northern Passenger Train. Jim notes the first coach on this train was usually an old luxury coach. It had been remodeled with a small food service area. The attendant also had a small grocery cart that he would make a trip through the train selling sandwiches and canned soft drinks. Of course, for an extra buck twenty, you could ride in the parlor car. Do you know which of these trains was not a GN train? Was it A, the Gopher Badger, B, the Western Star, C, the Winnipegger, or D, the Empire Builder? Dead giveaway. Dead giveaway. Over the course of time, I've compiled a long list of locomotives that I've done uh, programming on. In this case, we're going to take a look at GN510. That is going to be the E7 that will go on the uh, Gopher Badger. There are a couple of things to note. As I said, I fill out this uh, information for the locomotive, and uh, we move forward to actually getting it speed matched. There are two different cases in which you're going to speed match a locomotive. You can either do it basic speed control, which all these locomotives are done. You can see a few of them are a little bit off. And that's because they're not as refined. I use the advanced speed table to be able to really dial in the actual speed of the locomotive. Now, if you just want the quick and dirty, stick to the basic, and that is the uh, low, medium, and high voltage. I use the AccuTrack speedometer to be able to tell how fast a locomotive goes on each of those steps. The first step I might have set for 1 mile an hour. The second, I'll have it set up to maybe 40 miles an hour, and the bottom I'll have set to like 60 miles an hour. Now, if this just gets you close and that's good enough for you, go ahead and do this. But if you want to refine it a little bit more, we'll take a look at the advanced speed steps here in a little bit. Well, look at look at here. We've got ourselves some m and s You can't resist it. There's some prototype stuff here involved as well. This is a great gathering. Joe put together a number of guys and had them bring a lot of their m and s equipment, prototype, modeling, pictures, you name it. Uh, gives us a great opportunity to look at all the different stuff that other modelers are doing in all kinds of different scales. Like Steve's engine facility here in HO scale. This is incredibly cool. And the modeling to be able to talk to these guys firsthand is definitely worth the time to be able to at least chit-chat and learn a little bit more about the prototypes. They got some brass mixed in as well as some of the custom models that guys have done as well. Like these cabooses that were done by Everett as well as the freight cars that you can see in the background. And it wasn't all m &S. It turns out a Sioux Line boxcar showed up? I mean who would bring Sioux Line to an m &S gathering? Well none other than Mr. Bob Rivard who hacked the top off this like the real railroad school. and wanted to share it with the masses. That's what's cool about having a gathering like this is to see the modeling of fellow modelers and the things that they do. They share their techniques, they share the photos, and they share the history that sometimes is just unattainable. It was a great program and a great thing that was put together by Joe, so thanks for doing that, buddy.
It's Mopar or no car. Then what's the Chevy doing in there? I don't know. We might as well cut it apart. That's what I'm doing here is putting on the wheels from this Chevy convertible. It's uh, Malibu models, and we end up taking these Oxford cars and swapping the wheels out. This is a nice distinction that can be done. I think the black uh, Daytona on the right here, it's got a few issues that it could be addressed, but it's kind of cool. It's got a roll cage. We end up going through this and swapping the wheels out. Between the three, the one on the right is the Daytona. The one on the left was the Charger's original. We end up putting the Camaro's wheels on the Charger, the Charger's wheels on the Daytona, and then we'll end up just throwing the Daytona wheels onto the uh, Camaro, and, well, you'll see how it looks. All right, so the Camaro looks ridiculous. The Daytona looks okay. I might consider a different wheel set on that in the future, but I ended up liking the way the Charger turned out. We'll do a little something extra to this in just a moment. All right, how great do you know the Great Northern? Do you know which of these trains was not a GN train? It was C, the Winnipegger. The Winnipegger was a Sioux Line passenger train, but the GN ran number seven and number eight, known as the Winnipeg Limited. We all know cars don't drive straight all the time, but most of these 187 scale cars, their wheels are set straight, so what I do is I take a pliers and I bend the axles just slightly to be able to give them a rotated look, and you can turn them left or right, and that's just as simply by rolling the car. As you can see here, I'll reinstall the wheels onto this uh, charger and take a look at him pulling into his driveway. That's not too bad. All right, this is the locomotive that we have sitting on the program track. We are about to speed match using a speed table. I consider this advanced speed matching. And what I'm doing here is setting standards. On the throttle, it is set to 20. I want the locomotive moving at the speed of mile an hour that is displayed on the throttle. I do this by using the AccuTrack speedometer in conjunction with JMRI. I locate number 510 in the list of locomotives, and I want to make sure it is on the program track, set to program track in JMRI. I go in then and find the speed table, and I will read the speed table to see what the decoder has programmed in it currently. This same thing can be done if you're not using the speed table and you're doing basic speed matching. You do this here, you hit read full sheet and get the information, but we are using speed table. That is key for the advanced programming. And what we're going to do here is try to find the rough speed of the locomotive at various points across the table. And to do that, you can check the boxes across the bottom, and then you're going to slowly, kind of incrementally, find what is the speed of the locomotive at those points. I will adjust those points periodically, but they actually snap and they allow between each check mark. When you make these adjustments, you can see all the other ones kind of move along with it. And that just helps you give you a smoother transition between each of the speed steps. And now that we've read the decoder and we're ready to be able to start programming this, I've changed this to programming on the main, and I've set the locomotive on the main. And one thing to be sure of is that you don't have another locomotive on the main with the same number, because you'll be programming the same information into both locomotives. Might be helpful if you're actually trying to program two locomotives at the same time, made by the same manufacturer with the same decoder and everything else, but that's just me. All right, this is a tedious process, so I've time-lapsed it, and I'm just going to kind of walk you through what I'm doing. If you look on the left, it says V start 4. That's voltage start. When I tick the dial to 1 on the throttle, I have to be up to 4 to be able to get it to read 1 mile an hour through the speed tunnel. Now, you see V high on the right? That's bouncing around a lot. Right now, it's at 194. I changed that. I'm trying to find where 60 miles an hour is. As you can see, the table, it's bouncing around quite a bit. It's dancing. I go, dance, you little puppet. Am I a real boy? Well, as it dances along, I'm going through trying to find each of those incremental steps. I usually look for 10 miles an hour. I look for 20 miles an hour. I look for 30 miles an hour. So if you see the throttle itself, you'll see 60 right now. There's 30. I'm looking at 20, there's 10, it's bouncing around a lot, but that's what I'm doing. And once I get it dialed in, I can get these type of results. Be sure and save it. I never thought we'd get to the end there. 
Well, to have standards like this helps be able to run locomotives together. All of our locomotives can run at 20 miles an hour, 10 miles an hour. makes things a lot smoother as far as working together, and uh, I think it's worth it in the end. You done shoot about as good as you model. Let me introduce myself. Columbo Hannon. I'm on hell on wheels. Work for the Union Pacific Railroad. Yeah. I was asked to answer a few questions from some of you modelers. One of them was, where's the curmudgeon? I shot him in the back. He was driving me nuts. He gone. He ain't coming back. You can move on, and if you don't like me, I don't care. I moved on. Cones out. Hopefully you enjoyed this most recent episode of the GN in 1970, and even if you didn't, you can pop over to the channel and take a look and see if there's a video there you might like. There's the GN in 1970, the virtual tour of the GN in 1970, as well as Sue the Milwaukee Road. I want to give a huge thanks to those that have hit the like button, hit subscribe, as well as commented on various videos. It means a lot to me because we've actually connected as modelers and be able to learn different tips from one another, as well as learn about other channels and guys that are sharing content. I don't make these videos for me, I make these videos for you, so hopefully you're enjoying them and you enjoy the future episodes of the GN in 1970. 70s.